So thank you very much, Donald, for the introduction, and thanks to Paddy and Jim for the invitation to be here uh, today and to Inclusion Ireland for organising this very important event. I'm going to give a talk today. It's going to be an overview initially on the direct and indirect economic costs of disability. But what I'm going to do primarily is I'm going to focus on the direct economic costs. I'm going to leave it to Dorothy to talk a little bit more about some of the indirect costs, but I want to give a sort of a, an overview of what the, uh, the different types of economic costs of disability are. But before I get started, what I want to do is I want to make a couple of points that I think are important to bear in mind as I go through this discussion this morning. Um, the first point that I want to make is that it seems to me that everybody seems to love a big number and the bigger the number the better the number and there's lots of different types of studies called cost of illness studies which estimate something like the economic cost of um, obesity is 1.13 billion euros per annum or the cost of dementia is 1.69 billion euros per annum, these very precise numbers. Um, and the point that I want to make is that I think it's important when we talk about costs, and I'm going to present some big numbers today, some headline numbers today that are a little bit different in nature to these types of costs, but the point I want to make is it's important not to fixate too much on what specifically that number is, okay? Because very often, you know, you might have a number, but someone else might come along with a bigger number. Does that mean that their issue or that issue is more important than yours? Probably not. Very often these numbers are extremely precise. The reality is that the researchers who conduct these studies, they come up with a number, but there may not be the precision associated with the cost estimates that they would like to let on. And then the third problem, which I think is the most important issue to bear in mind, is that very often it's not absolutely clear what the actual number means. Newspapers like to run with the number because it's a nice heading. 1.69 billion sounds like a big number and something very, very important. But it's much more important to actually understand what the number means, how it's been constructed, and what are its implications both for individuals, and in this case individuals with disabilities, but also in terms of what we should do to address the specific problem. So there's a big discussion or there's a big buzz around what's called the formulation of evidence-based policy. And what I want you to do today is to think about the numbers that I show you, number one, what they mean for individuals, with disabilities, but number two, what it is they imply for what policymakers should do. Okay, so I'm going to present some big numbers. I don't want to fix too much on what the actual number is. I want to think about the implications of the number, both for individuals and for policymakers. Okay, so in terms of the economic cost of disability, at least the way economists think about it, there are two different types of economic costs for individuals, but also importantly for their families. The one that I'm going to focus on in the main today is direct costs. And these are basically the additional expenditures that arise due to disability in people's day-to-day -day lives. Now, these direct costs lead to what economists call a conversion handicap. It means people with disabilities and their families have a difficulty converting their income into economic well-being or standard of living. And the reason for that is, out of that sort of income that they have, a proportion of that or an amount of that has been diverted onto goods and services that are related to a person's disability and has not been spent on goods and services that people ordinarily would associate with a good standard of living. So people with disabilities, as a direct result of these costs, basically automatically will have a lower standard of living. And that's, they're the types of costs that I'm going to focus on today. But there are also a range of other types of costs that are very important to consider also. These are indirect costs which are associated with lower employment opportunities and reduced human capital accumulation possibilities. So for example, we know from lots of data that people with disabilities tend to have lower labour market participation rates, lower rates of employment. If they are employed, their earnings are lower. Um, and very often they're more likely to have to turn down work opportunities when they arise. They also face barriers in terms of education. Human capital is a term that economists use to capture um, education, training, um, uh, work experience. And if you look at differences in education levels between disabled and non-disabled people, what you see is that uh, disabled people have much lower levels of education on average. Now, what all of these indirect costs associated with reduced labour force participation and employment and human capital accumulation imply is that in addition to the conversion handicap, people with disabilities also face an earnings handicap. Okay, their earnings are lower and out of those reduced earnings there's also a conversion handicap in terms of attaining a standard of living or a good standard of living. What it implies at an aggregate level is 
in combination of direct and indirect costs is that people with disabilities tend to have higher rates of poverty, higher rates of deprivation, higher rates of economic um, uh, um, disadvantage, but also lower standards of living. And together, these costs obviously have a very, very negative impact on the socioeconomic and economic well-being of people with disabilities. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about direct costs. I'm going to be focusing on direct costs in the main today. Um, it's important within, you know, as we're talking about these costs, it's important to acknowledge that there are already a range of different interventions, you know, that promote the well-being and social inclusion of people with disabilities. And these include policies to ensure that there's an adequate income for people living with disabilities. So there are obviously a range of services and supports already in place. But in relation to the direct costs, which is what I want to focus on, this is explicitly or has been explicitly acknowledged by policymakers and others for a number of years. So, for example, in 1993, there was a United Nations General Assembly resolution which specifically recommended that when policymakers formulate these sorts of policies, that they explicitly take account of these direct costs. So the direct costs and the extent of the direct costs should be used in order to guide the policies uh, that are implemented. In Ireland, there was a commission on the status of people with disabilities in 1996. One of the things that that commission did was to set up a working group to investigate the possibility of introducing a cost of disability payment. Now that working group, it was an interdepartmental mark, uh, working group, that led in 2004 to the NDA commissioning a major report by Indicon Economic Consultants and that result found that the direct economic cost of disability, these direct costs, are very, very high, they're very, very significant, and the report recommended that a cost of disability payment be introduced. After that, that was 2004, nothing. The issue of a cost of disability payment, the issue of cost of disability, seemed to fall off the policy radar. And one of the things that I'm going to be saying today, or the case that I'm going to be saying today is, I'm going to present you with evidence in relation to cost of disability, and I'm going to argue that we need to bring back the cost of disability payment to the policy radar. Okay, so before we go start talking about or thinking about a cost of disability payment, what it might look like, how much it should be, who should get it, we need to start off and try and identify or estimate firstly what are those direct private economic costs of disability. So this is something that I and some colleagues of mine have been looking to estimate in a, a number of pieces of work over the last few years where we look to basically identify the additional spending needs of households with disabled individuals in Ireland. So all of the analysis that we do doesn't just focus on individuals, it focuses on the households in which individuals reside. So it's a household level analysis. And the particular piece of work that I'm going to talk about today focuses on adult disability. We do additional work which considers childhood disability, which hopefully I'll have a couple of moments to talk about at the end. And in this particular piece of research that I'm going to present, we don't consider the other indirect costs of disability that I alluded to earlier. These lower employment opportunities, education opportunities, this, uh, this earnings handicap. So we're specifically focused on estimating the direct private economic costs of disability. And what I want to do is, and this might sound a little bit like a boring economics lecture, maybe many of you have taken economics before and I'm an economics lecturer, but I'm going to go through basically the different ways in which we might go about trying to estimate what these different economic costs are. Because depending on the approach you take, you might get a different number, okay? And the number that you get might have different implications. So what I want to do from the very, very outset is I want to be absolutely clear what my number means, how it's been derived, what are the strengths of that number, and what are the weaknesses of that number, and what it means. Okay? And that is a function of the approach that you take to estimating these economic costs. So there are three main approaches within the sort of the literature that looks at economic costs, direct economic costs of disability. And the first one, and probably the most obvious one, is something called the direct survey approach. It's basically a very, very straightforward idea. You would have a questionnaire or a survey of people with disabilities. You ask them, what additional costs do you face as a result of your disability? How much are those costs? So how much does, do you spend? And then you aggregate for an individual across all of those additional costs to get an estimate of that individual's cost of disability. And then if you do that for a sample of individuals, what you can do is you can average across the sample and you'd have an estimated average cost of disability for the cohort. Now, there's a number of methodological issues that I think are problematic with that approach. The main one is that a person's 
costs of disability or their direct expenditures, additional expenditures, will be constrained by their income. So you could take two individuals with the same general circumstances, the same disability or condition, one with a very high income, one with a very low income, the person with a low income will have lower cost based on that approach because they have less income to spend on disability related goods and services. Which means basically the costs associated with disability that would be estimated from this direct survey approach are going to be constrained by people's incomes and we know people with disability, their incomes are already constrained because of the other indirect costs that they face. So there's a problem using that approach. There's also a basic problem in just thinking about how much extra do I spend per week on heating or lighting or transport or aids and appliances or whatever the additional source of cost is, trying to figure out, well, how much extra do I spend, even how much do I spend? Because what's very difficult in this situation is to imagine what would expenditures be in the counterfactual situation where the person doesn't have a disability. So from that point of view, the direct survey approach has some limitations. It also has some advantages in that it will help you to ident identify the sources of additional costs where they arise. So that's uh, one particular advantage. To get around some of the problems with the direct survey approach, a budget standards approach has also been developed. And the idea here basically is that in consultation with people with disabilities, experts would identify a list of different expenditure types that are important for people with disabilities, cost those, add them up, and figure out basically, or try to establish what additional spending needs arise in order to attain what's called a basic standard of living. Now, this gets at some of the problems associated with the first approach because it is not going to necessarily be constrained by income. You basically identify what expenditures you would need and someone costs those. But one of the problems with the approach is how do you define what a basic standard of living is? Okay? In other words, there's a level of subjectivity associated with the budget standards approach, which means that it's not always going to be the perfect approach either. So, both of these approaches have some limitations. They both add some value, of course, and ideally what you'd want is someone to do the sort of research and use all of the different approaches. But the first two approaches are what, what are called bottom-up approaches, in that you basically identify the sources of additional costs and you add them up. The approach that I'm going to try and sell today is a very, very different type of approach. It's called a top-down approach or an indirect approach, which basically looks to estimate the impact of disability on standard of living of households and to try and generate a cost estimate from that. So it's a very, very different kind of approach. It has a range of different advantages over the other two approaches. It basically counteracts some of the issues that I've just mentioned, but it in itself also has some limitations and some disadvantages which should also be acknowledged. But this is how the approach works. It basically starts off with a pretty simple underlying assumption, which is that the resources of a household, any household, and specifically the income of that household, will determine a household's standard of living. And that for some given level of income, there's going to be a reduction in the standard of living of a disabled household where additional needs arise due to the presence of a disability within the household. And this basically is primarily a result of the diversion of income, basically scarce resources, to disability related goods and services. And if you're spending money on extra heating, transport, aids and appliances, medicines, carers, etc, 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 that money is therefore no longer available to spend on goods and services that we generally think are related to standard of living. So what we do basically then using the approach is we try to figure out the cost of disability as a measure basically of the extra income that's required by a disabled household to achieve the standard of living as an equivalent non-disabled household. Now, appreciate not everyone's going to love graphs as much as I do, but I think the best way to understand the number that I'm going to present to you at the end of this talk today is to work through this diagram. And I think it's pretty conceptually fairly straightforward but it's a different type of cost to the one that I mentioned earlier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just talk through it for a moment because it has big implications in terms of what it is we should do as a result of these economic costs. So if you hate diagrams and you hate this sorts of, these sorts of analyses, you can switch off for a moment. I'm going to come back and talk about the numbers in a moment. The basic idea here is that each household, and all of the analysis is going to be done at the household level, but every household is going to have some level of standard of living. And for any given household, that standard of living will be a function of the income of the household. 
So we have, basically, if you like, we've income along this axis, we've standard of living along this axis, and the idea basically is that as a household's income goes up, its standard of living goes up. Why? Because it can afford to buy more goods and services that are associated with economic well-being. Now, that's fine. And all households are assumed to have this relationship. The other assumption that we make, however, is that for disabled households, they also have that type of relationship, but the line for disabled households is basically lying below that for non-disabled households. And the implication is that if you were to take some level of income, we'll call it Y0, the standard of living of the disabled household is less than the standard of living of the non-disabled household. Okay, that's the starting premise. In terms of conceptualizing or thinking about what we mean by cost of disability then, this particular approach says, well, you know, there will be some level of income, we'll call it Y1, at which the disabled household will have the same standard of living as the non-disabled household at Y0. Okay, how do we see that? Well, we go to Y1, and the line here predicts that the standard of living for the disabled household is the same as the standard of living as the non-disabled household at Y0. And it's this gap between Y0 and Y1 which this particular methodology identifies as the cost of disability. The extra income that the disabled household would require to have the same standard of living as the non-disabled household. And one point I want to make in relation to this approach, because in contrast to other approaches, this approach has been used in many studies, both in Ireland and internationally. Many of these studies have been published in peer-reviewed academic journals, in uh, high quality reports. The approach that we take here is, if you like, internationally verified. Okay, It's got some stamp of approval, it's been published in these journals, it's been reviewed by peers or experts in the area, and it's been, there's a range of different cost estimates available from different countries and also for Ireland, many of which I've been involved in. So what I'm trying to argue is we should take some confidence from the approach that has been utilized here. There are many advantages to it, there are obviously some disadvantages, but it is widely used and valuable. Okay, so before we go on and look at some numbers, I just want to make a couple of points in relation to some important information about the approach. The first is we have very good high quality data in Ireland to utilize this approach. So we use data from the Survey of Income and Living Conditions for 2011, so we have relatively up-to-date information, and that gives us a sample of about 11,000 individuals or about 4,000 households. So we have a very large data set, we have good information in relation to a range of characteristics of the individuals in the household that we need to utilize the approach. And what it means is we can get, because this is a representative sample, we can get a good representative picture of what the cost of disability is in Ireland. So that's in contrast to, say, individual personal stories, which are also very, very valuable in thinking about the cost of disability. But what we do is we present an overall aggregate view of disability and the economic cost of disability, and that can only be done by these very, very large scale surveys. So we're fortunate to have that information. A couple of other things that should be borne in mind is that we have this sort of setup where we're saying, look, disability impacts on standard of living of households. One of the drawbacks of this approach is that there is no measure of standard of living in these types of surveys. What does it mean to say the standard of living of a household is 5 or 10 or 15 or whatever it is? Basically, we have to go about constructing a standard of living measure. And we do that in the data set by using a range of individual indicators, goods and services that we think households would like to have or better off households would have. Things like a dishwasher, a washing machine, whether the household has gone on holidays, whether they have savings, so on and so forth. So we basically proxy for standard of living in that way. And that's consistent with other um, deprivation type measures that you'll be fairly uh, um, familiar with. And we also define disability in a couple of different ways. There, one of the sort of, I suppose, the issues with measuring the cost of disability using these sorts of surveys is disability tends to be self-reported in these types of surveys. So questions are asked, do you have one of the following conditions or, um, or impairments, for example, and an individual may answer yes to one or more of those. And we can basically classify people as being disabled on the basis of that measure. It's a very kind of medical model approach to defining disability. And in our paper, we say, look, this is one way of doing it, and it gives us what we call a condition-based measure. 
But there's another way we can also identify disability in the survey, because there's other questions there which says, look, if you have some condition, are you limited to some extent in undertaking one of a range of different activities, like going to the shop or going to the doctors or something like that? And if you do, basically, you're classified as being disabled in a more sort of social model of disability context, based on what we call a limitation-based measure. And there will be many people who will be defined as having a disability based on the condition-based model or measure, but won't be defined as being disabled on the limitation-based measure, basically because they have some condition, but it doesn't limit them in their day-to-day -day activities. Okay, so it's important to bear that in mind. Because what I presented here, basically, are the headline figures. These are the numbers that I don't want you to get too fixated on. Okay, they are important because they give us a sense of the magnitude of the cost, but again, it's important not to fixate too much on them. The implications of them is much more important. Basically, what we find in our analysis is, if we use the condition-based measure, we find the estimated cost of disability is about 35%. Now, if you were to take of, of weekly income, if you were to take the average weekly income for a disabled household, which at the time was 584, what that implies is the estimated economic cost of disability using this approach is 207 euros. So going back to my diagram, we'd start off with some average income of 584. What our approach is finding is you would have to give the household, the disabled household, an extra 207 euros to bring it up to the same standard of living as a non-disabled household. That does not imply that we should have a cost of disability payment of 200 euros per week. It does not imply that. What it implies is that this is one measure of the cost of disability and also that the standards of living of disabled households are significantly below uh, non-disabled households. If you take the more sort of social model of disability measure, the limitation-based measure, the proportion of costs are higher. They're as high as 276 euros per week. And these numbers are very, very significant. Their precise magnitude is not really something that we need to focus on. This converts to about 10 grand a year. This converts to about 14 grand per year. They're big numbers. They're really significant additional costs. And what I think they suggest is, you know, because these estimates are based, are derived, after we take account of all current supports and services that people with disabilities already receive, these are basically the additional costs they face after receiving their current entitlements. So they're very, very large indeed. Okay, so running out of time here, folks, so just a couple more points. We also do this sort of analysis looking at different types of households. So we find, for example, because we know that there's evidence of clustering of disability within households, we know, for example, that there are many households with more than one person with a disability in them. What that means for these cost estimates is that they are significantly greater where you've got two or more people with a disability than if you've only got one person with a disability. Real problems associated with multiple disabilities and these extra costs. Okay, the proportions are much, much higher. Similarly, there's a really strong gradient in these cost estimates if we distinguish by severity of disability or the degree to which a person is limited by that disability. We find that those most limited are by far the ones most affected by these extra costs. And maybe that's something we need to think about when targeting a particular policy, say, for example, in relation to a cost of disability. Okay, so main conclusions, because I think i am maybe got one minute. Main conclusions here are that the economic cost of disability is large, it has a major impact on standard of living, okay? That's what our evidence is showing. We have some headline numbers, but what I would be saying is, look, these headline numbers are not as important as saying these costs are driving down the standards of living of disabled households. It varies by different types of household, by the severity of the disability. We found in previous work that it's particularly severe for single, older men living alone in isolated uh, communities. We found extremely high costs. So we can do this sort of analysis by household type and identify those who are most affected by these additional costs. But where I think this particular piece of research is most useful is in thinking about the policy implications, okay? Because what it's suggesting is the policy in Ireland at the moment does not go nearly far enough in terms of addressing the direct cost of disability. Even after we take into account all of the current services and payments, the additional cost of disability are very, very high. They are driving down the standard of living of these households, and they're also driving these households into poverty and deprivation. What they clearly do, I would argue, is that they would support the case 
for disability related poverty payments, number one, but more specifically, they suggest that I think it's time now that we think again about the introduction of a cost of disability payment. If you believe in evidence-based policy, and what I've done is basically presented what I think is compelling evidence of very high and significant economic costs, if you believe in that sort of evidence-based approach to policy making, then what these numbers suggest is now it's time to get a cost of disability payment back on the policy radar and back in the discussions. Because this is one way, and it's the obvious way, in terms of addressing these extra costs. And the final point that I want to make coming up to the budget is one of the things that I was sort of conscious of over doing this research over the last few years was that when it came to every budget, we had cutbacks in the disability area, cutbacks on disability expenditures. The implication of those sorts of cutbacks, budgetary cutbacks, is that services that were being utilised with people by disabilities, which were no longer being funded by the state, these had to be funded from somewhere, and where they were being funded from was people's own pockets. One of the reasons these cost estimates are so high, one of the reasons they're high in an international context, is that people are basically meeting payments for services and supports out of their own pocket instead of having these services provided by the state. And what that basically means is that every time you hear in the budget the cutbacks in terms of specific supports and services and payments, this is directly driving up these direct economic costs of disability. Okay, so I think I'm out of time, so I'll finish up there, and uh, thank you all very much for your attention.